study the great controversy, you know? Mm. We're going to learn about the enemy. Well, you can't fight a battle if you don't know the enemy, can you? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You got to know the right side from the left side. Many people are on the side of the enemy and, 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 and think they're on the side of God. Yes. There we are. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Like the elder Kip said, I wish I had the enthusiasm that he has when he come here. Mm. I still think I'm about 24. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us have our opening prayer this morning. Father in heaven, indeed, we are truly thankful to be in your house this morning. We are here this morning because we want to lift up the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. We believe there, Lord, in the depth of our hearts that he's worthy of all of our adorations and praises. And we pray there, Father, that you would bless us and be with us in a special way today. As we open up your word and study there, Lord, even as we open up this portion of the program, Lord, we ask you to be with us. And we know, there, Father, that there are others who are in route, and they need prayer there, Lord. They need safe guidance. They need angels there, Lord, to watch over them in the Holy Spirit, as do we there, Lord. And we pray there, Father, that we all be blessed today, that we'll have a wonderful and a blessed time just praising your holy name. Amen. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Our opening song this morning said, God sent his son. Shall we stand? God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, healed and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my part. 
Now, you may be seated. We are, we are a little low this morning, huh? But you know what? I believe that the angels of the Lord is here. Yes, and they expect the same thing out of us if it had been a hundred people. So, amen. It, that's right, amen. So right now we're going to introduce our elder Kip. Oh, scripture reading. Thank you, um, Tony. I don't know why I so often omit reading the Word of God. Uh, okay, you can sit. Let us just read it together. Now this. That if we ask anything, hard according to his will, he will. Us. Whatever he has, yes. We know, and we have the petitions that we have. Amen. Amen. You know, so many people, you know, when they come down to asking God, they leave out that little statement that that that, that was there, that when we ask God for things. We should ask things that is well. We should ask God for things that is well. In his will. Things that he wants us to have. So if we have enough time as we bring this pushing our program to a close. We'll talk about uh, the things that God would like for us to petition him for. Matter of fact the thought this morning, Tony. Uh, you don't generally put it up, but yeah. I, is it there? You want the, the verse? No, 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 no. I was just talking about I, there's a title I put in there and the title was Petition. Okay, very well. Thank you, Mr. Maddox. And is this yours, sir, or is this left for That's mine. That's yours. Okay. And the bullet bulletin they instructed me not to lose it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that. Good morning, good Sabbath school members. Hey, good, morning. good morning. We have tripled in size in the past two minutes. <laughs> Yes, praise the Lord. There's no doubt about that. Well. Okay. All right. The cosmic conflict. The, the war behind all wars. Now, it's very interesting. That this is one of the smashing good lessons that we have this, uh, this year. Now, I'd like you to open Revelation. Let's see. I know I need my glasses on. Brother Teacher, no, I just wanted to say this. That title... War behind all walls. I was impressed with uh, whoever was that came up with that thought because it's exactly what it is. Yes, it is. So let's take a look at Revelation 12 7. The first phrase. I think it's the first four verses. Uh, excuse me, the first four words. Let's look up Revelation 12, 7. Now when, the be when, now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from... Oh. Um, then, the, then war broke out in heaven. Yes! Michael and yes, his angels... That's all we needed right now. The first, first few words. 
Now, does that sound legit? I mean, we have heaven where everything is perfect, and then it says right there in Revelation that what? No. That then war broke out. Then war broke out. This is astounding. How is it even possible for war to break out in a perfect environment? Imagination, comprehension, everything. But we can find the answer. Let's look. Who led out in this rebellion? That's in Revelation 12, 7, and that's the rest of the verse. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Yes. Michael. Yes, the dragon and his angels. Excuse me, brother teacher. Yes, sir. You know, um, at that point in time, had his name already been changed? You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Michael uh, is Jesus. Huh? Well, uh, Michael. Uh, we've got Michael. People. Okay, I understand. Michael is Jesus. Yes, but but okay. you're talking about the devil. Yeah, I think his name at that time was still Lucifer. Where did it get changed at? Well, that's a very good, very good question. Excuse me. Could the statement be read again? Yes. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. You know, the timeline on this whole thing is, is perplexing, you know? And we, we, I'm sure that it, there's a lot of things that has transpired prior to him being in a fight with Michael. You know, he had fallen, he had taken angels. So I'm thinking at this point in time that his name could have been changed to uh, the dragon, yeah. But of course they're talking about the dragon in the past when this was written. So it could have been maybe any time. But it wasn't so much when as who. Mm. Who let out in this rebellion? Now, what can we learn about this dragon from the following verses in the book of Revelation 12, 17? Let's take a look at that verse. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yes. Now, it's very interesting that this dragon made war against the remnant of her seed. Now, Brother Teacher, again, we know that that had, it had been, we're talking about the woman, we're talking about the church now. Yes. So we know a timeline for that because um, I guess it's, it's, it's more or less again, like you say, what transpired rather than the timeline it transpired. Well, we'll try to find some answers. Let's turn to 13.4. Revelation 13.4. People worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worship the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Who can wage war against it? And how about 16, 13 through 14? Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and, and 
out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of the God Almighty. Yes, unto the great day of the battle of God Almighty. And one last one is 20, chapter 20 of Revelation 1 and 2. Yes. So quite a number of things here. How, yes, absolutely. Yes. How is this dragon further identified in Revelation 12, 9? The mind shed some light. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Yes. Well, so, tell me again, what were those several words that described the old serpent the called the devil and Satan? Yes. yes they. Now, when, here comes when, when was the fallen angel Satan also called that old serpent and the dragon cast out of heaven. Is that just uh, a question for all? Uh, is it says when he fought with Michael and his angels and prevailed not. Yes. So it doesn't say an exact time. It just says after he fought with Michael and his angels. Yes. Now, where did he go? He was permitted to come to this earth. He was. Now, what does the Bible reveal about the origin of this rebellious angel? That's in Ezekiel. 28, 12 and through 15. Twelve through fifteen? Yes. Ezekiel twenty-eight, twelve through fifteen. Mm -hmm. Son of man, take up a lamentation with the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tab tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. Until that day, iniquity was found in thee. The iniquity was found. He was perfect. He was beautiful. He had a voice that was at least three octaves, maybe four. It was quite, quite astounding. And yet, and yet, iniquity was found in him. Now, what is this verse? Why is this verse saying this? Excuse me, Brother Teacher, again. An awful lot was said in what she read there this morning. And one of the things was that he was an angel with special, special privileges. You know, what it said about him that he could walk the coals of fire, what it was saying is that 
he could walk directly into the presence of God whenever he got ready. Yes. And, and I can see him feeling special because all of his attributes and assets. But, um, and, and it's pretty typical today when you find people like that, many times it can take them right over the top. They began, he, he began to think that, that, that he was equal to God in a lot of things. But he, he, he didn't realize that he was a created being and God was a self-existing individual. That's the big difference between him and God. And, and even if he got the position that he, that he, that he desired, he wouldn't be able to handle jo the job that was associated with it, being a created being. That's true. But let's turn to Isaiah 14. Elder, before you go on, I just want to make a point. Um, you look at the language because in, in, the, in the other version of the Sabbath school lesson, it asks us to compare Isaiah and Ezekiel's account of the fall of Lucifer. But what I appreciate about the language that's used in Ezekiel's account, well, sets, it sets you up to be able to come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. We can't understand it but it is definitely sure mm -hmm. that this being is responsible for his own fall. Yes, and that's mm. what I was going to bring out after we read uh, Isaiah, Isaiah. Okay, but that, that is a very valuable bit of data <laughs> that God made this person perfect. He was not responsible for sin. Let's turn to Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly upon the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. And 14. Yes. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Yes. He had lofty ideals. But... What was, what was he saying besides what is said there? Well, one thing. I will ascend above everything. I will make I myself. I will ascend above everything, including. God. The God. High. Yes. You know, he said that he would be like God, he could never be God. He could never have, he could be like God in the fact that he could show some resemblance, but he could never be God. Well, you're speaking like a Christian, but this is not what he had in his mind. And you know, you've heard the saying, when convinced against the will of the same opinion still. You could tell him exactly what don't you realize. But he still refused to listen to you and considered himself equal with God or greater. There was one thing, though, that 
One important thing that he did not have the ability to do. Create. Create. Yes. Exactly. And of course, what was it that uh, God offered to Adam and Eve? Procreate. Yes. And that really bothered him. Now, why didn't God destroy this rebellious angel as soon as iniquity was found in his heart? Wouldn't that eradicate it? Wouldn't that avoid this controversy that we have here on earth? God gave us choice, though. So he, he didn't, he didn't want to uh, take away our choice. He did not want to take away our choice. But even more than that, he did not want sin to redevelop in his perfect heaven and earth and universe. He did not want sin to come about again. So, it would have affected his character too, the way, the way the angels and everybody looked at him. And yes. He's a, he's a God of love, but if he would have immediately destroyed Satan, well, we know that one of the reasons Jesus came was to restore um, all the things that Satan had said about God. And yes. Yes. So now we're going to switch from war in heaven to war strategies. Now, what was it that you said earlier, Elder, about learning about uh, the enemy? Uh, yeah. We must know what the enemy is, what his plans are, and so that we can Avoid controversy with him. What was Lucifer's war strategy? That's found in John 8, 44. Nobody to read they're looking. He is a liar and the father of it. Now, it's so interesting. If he had originally, but he was smarter than this, if it was originally something that he decided to walk up and tell the Lord just what he thought of him, how far would that get him? Well, there would be one person. But he didn't want one. He wanted as many angels as possible. So what did he do? Well, let's also take a look at Revelation 12, 4. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth, the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her children the moment he was born. A third. Yes. So he deceived the angels and came to this earth with some of them, a third of them, and deceived mankind as well. 
Yes, and he used the same technique, which is Lies. subtlety. Subtlety. He didn't say directly that God is a problem. He said, does God really want this this way? Does God really mean what he says? Now, God is omnipotent. And that comes from Revelation 19.6. That what means... That word again? Omnipotent or omnipotent. omnipotent is how he enunciated it. Yes. Omni. Omni omnipotent. That one I got, the other one. Yes. <laughs> omnipotent. Okay, very well. It's the same thing, but a some different people might syllable. Say that I'm, yes, <laughs> yes. Now that means Satan and the fallen angels are powerless to overcome their creator. Why did God choose a different strategy than force in this great controversy? And that's found in John. 316 first part. God is not a God of force. Mm -hmm. He's a God of love. That is correct. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. That's an awful lot of love, isn't it? It is. Because that, if we think about which one of us would give our son or our daughter for a for dying, um, undeserving world. Yes. Let's also turn to 1 John 4, 8. For God is love. love. Brother teacher, that is the big difference between God and Satan. Yes. In order to do what God did, he decided to give his, given his only begotten son but Satan, in order to do what he did, he wanted to take down a whole lot of other angels and everything along with him. And uh, it just shows his reason is not genuine. And he hopes that we don't use the word to contradict him. Amen. Now, love is, excuse me, love always respects freedom of choice. Let's turn to Genesis 2, 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And that was a quote from our Lord. Now what is also interesting is that what... Eve said to the snake, there was a subtle difference. He added, you shall not touch it. That's right. She added that.
Let's turn to Exodus 32, 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all of the sons of Levi gathered themselves unto him. How far? Uh, that's it. Now, jo there's Josiah, uh, excuse me, Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Now, this, each of these things demonstrated freedom of choice. Is that what God wanted? Yes, it is. Because he is not one who believes in forcing someone. What happens when you force someone? Is that something that he can get love from? No, it, it harbors uh, resentment. It harbors resentment. He wants his children to love him. And that takes choice. Now, when did you first, there's no verse here, so you have to, you have to use your personal experience. When did you first realize the importance of your personal choices in the battle between good and evil? Brother teacher. Has it been that long, Ben? <laughs> it's been that long. I've been born again um, about 45 years ago, so so it's it's been a while, but I realized immediately that I was in um, a conflict. I realized that that Jesus did live. It, it, it dawned on me all of a sudden that it's come to you, brother, that you're going to have to make a decision right now. Who are you going to be with? And when that came into my life, and I made that decision 45 years ago, and I haven't seen any reason anywhere along the way that I might want to turn back. I have the same revelation. When I was 13, which is 60 years ago. Mm. 60 years ago, I made the decision to follow my Lord. And of course, I never fell thereafter. You know, I have to be honest, I've made some mistakes and I've had lots of blunders, but there was a, never a time that I felt like that I was headed in the wrong direction. I always fell down and repented and asked the Lord to forgive me, get myself turned around and, 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 and move forward. And Ben, that's why you're the man you are today. But I'm not that man. At least I wasn't that man. There were many times that I felt confidence in myself. 
But it was at that same moment I was walking away from God. I needed God's presence all the time or I wouldn't have gotten into all these other problems. Now, I ask the question again, is there anyone else here who'd like to volunteer? When did you first realize the importance of your personal choices in the battle between good and evil? I think it happens every day. We have to, we have to uh, make the choice every day to do good or to um, do bad. Yes. And these times, you know what? Just as soon as I feel great in the Lord, that's when the devil subtly attracts and causes me, unless I stay clued in with my Lord, unless I live every day, then I will fall again. Now, I'd like to just make a quick comment to our friends who are on the internet. We are looking forward to you coming to our church sometime in the near future. Amen. The near future. We want to see you. We want you to praise God with us. And that's all I have to say on the matter at the moment. Now, the next section is conflict on planet Earth. When does the focal point of cosmic conflict between good and evil shift to, the, to planet Earth? When did it happen? First choice. Well, first you had to have an earth. Earth had to be created. There, has, there had to be a location for the devil to come in. And where was this central place in, the, in Eden? When did that tree start to grow and prosper? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was, was that always something? there. Aha! It was there and fully grown and bearing fruit when God introduced Adam and Eve to the garden. Yes. But when was it that the serpent was placed in that tree? Because remember, she could, she could have not eaten of it just because of the cautions. It said that when he was sent to earth, he and his um, angels at the end of the war in heaven. Yes. Yes. So there had to be a time in which Adam and Eve were, were not asked to go to that tree. They knew that they weren't supposed to touch this, not to touch, to eat of this tree. Let's turn to Genesis. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, 
For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Yes. Now, it's very interesting. If God said, do not eat of this tree, and the next day the devil tempted her, would she remember? Remember what kind of memory did Adam and Eve have? Perfect. Perfect. Couldn't make a mistake. So there had to be a period of time between the time that Christ first spoke of that, that region and Eve adding, she added to what God had said. There must have been a period of time. Maybe it's two weeks. Maybe it's two years. We don't know, at least I don't know, But the most important thing is that she ate of it. Now, she was deceived. Now, was Adam's memory better than hers? Apparently not, because he still ate it. Well, I like to suspect that Adam was not deceived. That he looked at Eve and did not listen to what the, the, the serpent had said. I'd like to suggest that. But he didn't want to give up Eve. She was too important to him. And that's why he purposely ate of that fruit, making the decision to take on the same condemnation from the Lord. I mean, would God really do something to us? Well, it says their eyes were both open. In the yes, they were. And that they knew they were naked. Yes, they did. Before that, they did not. They did not. Well, they were naked, but they weren't ashamed, it says. Yes, yes, yes. Now, the result, though, of sin, what did they find out? What happened in rapid progression? They discovered guilt. They discovered shame. It says that they hid from God. They used to just walk with him freely. And all of a sudden, they were scared. And what about a leaf? Pardon me? Started to die. They saw all of that for the first time. The result of sin is death. That comes from Romans 3.23. What stories in the Bible and even in our world today remind you that sin leads to death? Most of Leviticus, when you're going through the Mosaic Law, and it talks about all the stoning offenses. No. Um, there's lots of stories. Yes. The wages, the wages of sin is death. Um, well, let's take a look. There was no one that loved the Lord, or at least the Lord loved him, more than David. 
But what did David do? A lot of sin. A lot of sin. And when he committed sin, then death followed. When he found Bathsheba, what happened to the child? The child died. How does Satan, a murderer from the beginning, seek to increase the devastating results of sin? He's trying to take out as many people as he can because we're all, God, all God's children and he loves us and hurting us hurts God. Hurting us hurts God. Now, hope on the battlefield. This has been really depressing up to this point. What is the word hope? It instills in someone, even a small particle in your bosom, that God loves us. And 316, Matthew 316. Yes, he loves the world. He loves the world. He loves all of us. Let's turn to Matthew 1, 20 through 23. 1, but while he thought about it, the, about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. This gives hope. Let's turn to John 1, 29. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So Jesus Christ, at his birth, even before his birth, is to be a savior of his people. Those people who choose him. Now where do you see the promise of a savior revealed after our first parents sinned against their creator? Yes. Yes. Let's also turn to Genesis 3.21 and see what that says. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord 
God made coats of skin and clothed them. Adam and Eve were given a promise that one of their progeny was going to be their savior. What other passages of scripture remind us that our loving savior wants to clothe our nakedness and save us? And by the way, what is, what is it that he's supposed to clothe us with? Yeah, or robe of righteousness, yes. Let's turn to Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Yes. That is what we are supposed to be doing. Do I always remember that? No. There are so many things to remember that are good. But God is willing to give us that white robe. And why is it white? What is it washed in? The blood of Jesus, yes. Now, when did you first find, and there's no verse to this. When did you first find hope in your Savior? Well, when I found hope was when I realized I was without hope. I could not find a way of escape. And then I remembered that I have been washed in the blood of Jesus. And I asked my Lord for a way of escape and he provided it. Not only that, he took me as a combat medic and turned me into a physician assistant in a matter of six months. And that is what I wanted. Once again, when did you first find hope in your Savior? Well, it is a question that I offer you to consider today. When did you first find hope in your Savior? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for asking who will go and save these people from their sins and Christ said, here am I, send me. Oh Lord God, we thank you for your offering of your son to save us from our sins. We pray that we stay close to you, that when we need you, which is every moment, that we will be filled with joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Mission Report. A Heart for the Mission. RTM visited the Adventist Church in Uzbekistan several times in his childhood, taken by his father. But when his parents separated, he started living with his mother, who didn't allow him to go to church anymore. As he reached his teenage years, his father managed to take him to church because he said, quote, he needed to be baptized. The young man started attending church, studied the Bible, and soon he gave his heart to Jesus through baptism. However, when his mother remarried, Artyom's stepfather forbade him from going to church. The young man ended up being kicked out of the house and was welcomed into his father's home. There, he could grow closer to God. But after a while, his father stopped going to church, started drinking, and demanded that his son work with him on Saturdays. Artyom refused to work on God's Sabbath and was thrown out of his father's house. However, after a few months, his father passed away and he went to live with his paternal grandmother. It was then that the desire to do something for God began to grow, so Artyom organized a Bible study group. Several people showed interest in the study. As more time passed, God led him to want something more, to become a missionary. During this time, the pastor said, we would like to invite you to become a global mission pioneer. Artyom was so surprised. The pastor spoke about global missions even before he mentioned the dream he'd been harboring. Today, Artyom is a global missions pioneer and has helped people in his region accept Christ. Uzbekistan is a country quite closed to Christianity, so someone local talking about Christ makes all the difference. Part of this quarter's offering will help open the first Adventist school in Uzbekistan. Let's be generous with our offerings. We want to thank Elder Malak for leading out for us this morning. Brother Tony as well for giving us that mission story. I got a little mission funds here, Mr. Jim. Um, if, if you hold up your mission funds, uh, Mr. Jim will pick them up now. Well, there's a mission and offering fund. Yeah. We can just divide that, yeah. You think we're going to enjoy this new study on um, the great controversy? Amen. Yeah. You know, so many people live in this world and don't know what's going on around them. And, and, and there's a there's a battle. We're in the midst of a battle and we live as though everything is hunky-dory. But when in fact what we should be doing in the middle of this battle, what we should be doing. Praying for? Yes. Yeah, and, and, and every last one of us got to make a decision as to which side we are, we're going to be on. What happened if we don't make no choice? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know what he says? Yeah. If we don't make any choice, one is made for us, isn't it? Yeah, there you go. Very well. Praise the Lord, we are here this morning because what? We've, we've made a choice. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, it says closing thought there. How much time do we have, Tony? How many? Four. Four minutes. We've been circumventing. 
Three minutes. Um, every Sabbath, we've been just omitting the thought because of the fact that we run so short on time. Uh, pretty soon, I think we're going to have to stop putting that up there, or we're going to have to have a little thought. But this morning, there was a beautiful text that we had. Uh, put it up again for us, Tony. The thought that we, the text, the scripture. Let us sit there for a moment. The verse, the verse, the verse yes, sir. It said, now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything, any, you know, I, I, we need to be pay close attention to what this thing said right now. If we ask anything, what? According to his will. Now he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know whatsoever we ask. My eyes keep losing it. Okay. Whatsoever we know that we have the petition that we have asked. Am I reading this right? Yeah. Ask of him. Yeah, that's right. And um, you know, Miss White, she quickly addresses this thing. She says, he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that does what? Diligently seek him. There are times when we got to diligently seek God. She went quickly to, the, to, um, to, uh, to, to bring up the subject of Jacob. You remember how Jacob sought the Lord? He wrestled how long? All night long. And that angel got up the next morning and, and tried to stop Jacob by pulling his leg out of socket. Did Jacob give up? No, no, no. That's right. Sometimes we have to um, diligently seek the Lord. But there was another thought that I had too. It says, what are some of the things that we really need to ask the Lord for? Somebody. Anything. What, what, what should we ask? Clean hands and pure heart. Who? Clean hands and pure heart. Pure hands. Clean hands and pure heart. Okay. Yes. Very good. I like that. Anybody else? There are certain things that the word of God promised if we ask them that God will give to us. Anybody know one of those things then? I mean, I thought you all would be all over this. What, 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 what's some of the things that we really, really need? Say that again. Yeah, the first of the spirit. Yeah, we need love. We need wisdom. We need understanding, and God has promised to give us those things if we ask. Hmm? God answers the prayer of salvation immediately. Well, these things I'm talking about now is a part of salvation. I tell you what, give me, a, give me a good one. You remember Solomon? What did he ask God for? Huh? And what did God say? Because you have not asked for the death of your enemies, I will give you wisdom. And a flood 
of other things too. When we ask God for the right things, he not only give us that, but he give us a flood of other things. We need to ask God for the right things. Things We need to understand this, 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 this study that we're having now. We need understanding bad. And God will give us understanding. We need wisdom to, God's word is full of uh, challenging things. And we need wisdom to understand them. And when we ask God for those kind of things, he just blesses us for so many things. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be at God knows the standard things that you, you need. He knows you need a husband. He knows you need a wife. He knows you need a car. He knows you need a home. And when we ask God for the right things, when our minds is in the right place, God is going to provide us all of these other things. Amen. We really need to just, once we, once we get on that narrow path, we need to just, just ask God for the right things. All those other things. Get ready. All the, all the rest of them is coming. Come on, let us stand and close out this morning. What our closing song says?
wants to fill our cup. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are just so, so thankful. And we've been blessed through this portion of our program there, Lord. It's been a wonderful study of the great controversy. And we know there, Lord, that it's only going to get better. We pray there, Father, that you will just encourage hearts and strengthen hearts. Help us to realize there, Lord, that we should encourage each other to come on out to Sabbath school and study. These lessons are essential there, Lord, for our Christian growth. And we pray there, Lord, that you would bless every heart present here today there, Lord. And those who are watching via the internet, uh, whatever their choice there, Lord, we ask that you would just be with each of us today there, Lord. And as we leave this portion of our program, Lord, we head to our divine hour there, Lord. We just want you to come with us and continue bless them. Remember those who entranced their Lord, bring them safely. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen and thank you, their Lord. Consider yourselves dismissed for a little while. <laughs>